Why do so many blatantly incompetent and often quite reckless men become leaders in the first place? Incompetent men specialize at gaming the system. For we find this phenomenon where people fail up or fail upwards and go from one unsuccessful corporate gig to another. Psychologist and author. Dr. Tomas Chamorro per music. Hiring people who think differently from you or than you in terms of politics, ideology, religion, vision in general. It requires a very open mind, which most people don't have. Make others better. That I think is a fundamental thing leaders should do. Unlock the talent and potential in others. There is this wonderful quote by Plato that says, only those who don't seek power should be allowed to have it. And that doesn't happen very often. Charisma is neither good nor bad, but if it's coupled with low ethics and integrity, it's really, really destructive. The importance of maturity in followers, which is really, really important because the more immature your followers, the more likely it is that you have a despotic, tyrannical, autocratic, overconfident man in charge who actually doesn't know what they're talking about. To focus on talent rather than gender. And then you would not only get more women in leadership roles, You'll get more women than men in leadership roles and simultaneously elevate the quality of leaders. Where women have an advantage is when it comes to the more you use social media and the more dependent you are on other people's feedbacks, etc., the more narcissistic you are. The best way to check if you have narcissistic tendencies is... Hey there, friends. Welcome to the Happy Habit Podcast. I'm Matthew. You'll find me in this place every Monday and Thursday talking health, well-being and self-improvement with lots of experts. If that is your thing, you're in the right place. And if you're returning to the podcast, show your support. It'll cost you nothing and take you no time at all. You can leave a like, you can subscribe on whatever platform you're enjoying this content. You share with other people who you think might also get value from these episodes and leave the podcast a positive rating. I think we're up to 4.8 out of 5 now on iTunes and on Spotify. And you can also watch the videos of these episodes on Spotify and on YouTube where you can leave a comment. And if you've done so already, thank you very much indeed. Now today I'm joined by a world-leading expert in the field of psychology. His name is Dr. Tomas Shamora Pramusic. He's the Chief Talent Scientist at Manpower Group. He also serves as a professor in psychology at University College London and Columbia University. Along with that, he's written multiple books, including Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders? Now, I think we can all relate to working for someone who is in a leadership role, who is simply awful at their job. The very fact they managed to land that position in the first place is a source of mystery and often frustration to us and to everybody who has to work with that person. But these people, who are often men, hold leadership roles in every walk of life, from the boardroom to politics. In this episode, we ask how these people do it. How do they rise up the ladder? How do they fool so many people into believing they are competent, when in reality they are the complete opposite? Find out what the traits of a good leader are and learn why women have an advantage when it comes to these traits. We discuss how leadership in the past was more egalitarian than it is today. We hear why people are drawn towards charismatic leaders who give off an air of competence and certainty. We saw a great example of this during the pandemic, but giving off an air of competence is not the same thing as being competent. Discover how good leaders are able to go against their instincts and can embrace open-mindedness and diversity. Learn how to identify if your boss or indeed even you are a narcissist and find out how AI is making us even more narcissistic today. Plus, we talk about the role confidence plays in our lives socially and professionally and how we can harness it to become a better version of ourselves. This is a really fascinating discussion with a psychologist who manages to give answers to questions that many people don't even know to ask in the first place. I hope you enjoy. Well, I think we've all had a boss or line manager or someone in a leadership role who everyone in our workplace agrees is probably useless and is just the wrong person for that leadership role or job. So my initial question 
uh, Dr. Thomas, is probably an obvious one. Why do so many blatantly incompetent and often quite reckless men become leaders in the first place? I guess there are three main reasons. The first is that typically organizations don't really select on true leadership talent, let alone potential. It's things like, you know, people's ability to manage up, to play, you know, the game of politics, which includes engaging in Machiavellian tactics of manipulation, to take credit for other people's uh, achievements and blame others for their own mistakes. All of these things kind of pollute, corrupt, and interfere proper leadership selection or identification. That's the first one. The second is that even when those who make decisions to appoint people into leadership roles are well-intended and want to do things properly, style trumps substance. We focus too much on appearance. So if a candidate looks confident, charismatic, charming in an interview, we think, wow, they're leadership material. And in fact, those things might actually be, you know, subliminal indicators of things like narcissism or psychopathic traits. And the third is that actually in most complex jobs, it's not very easy to measure whether somebody is performing well as a leader. You can go all the way up to, you know, somebody who is a head of state, a president or a prime minister. It's very difficult to have an agreement or to have a discussion with somebody who is of the opposite political side of the spectrum to you and agree that, you know, this person was better than that one, that Biden was better than Trump or vice versa. And that's because the more complex the job, and that's often the case with leadership job, the easier it is to manipulate attributions of success or failure, right? Therefore, we find this phenomenon where people fail up or fail upwards and go from one unsuccessful corporate gig to another, increasing how much they charge for their speaking fees. When in fact, you know, they're actually not doing much, not adding value to the organization or the society. So these three things make it easier for people who are not competent to become leaders. And actually, incompetent men specialize at gaming the system within these parameters. Sometimes they can be women, but statistically speaking, they're more often men than women. What does it say about the people doing the promoting who promote people who very obviously and evidentially aren't suited to leadership roles. And I say that because, we, as I said at the outset, we all know people who in our workspace have been promoted to leadership roles and we're looking at each other going, how did they manage to get that job? Can the person who promoted them not see what everybody else can see? Yeah. Well, obviously, if the person who promoted them was promoted there for exactly the same wrong reasons, you know, incompetence trickles down and then it flows upwards in the organization at the same time. Um it is also possible that they're promoted because they fulfill a strategic goal for the person who promotes them. Uh, you know, look, if you work for me and I move roles and I put you in my role, but you're loyal to me, you're my buddy, uh, you ensure that you look after me and you tell me if somebody is up to get me and, you know, we're part of that. I mean... There's a lot of kind of selfish agendas that perpetuate this. Uh, it's also possible that, you know, um, my idea of somebody who is a great candidate is biased by my deluded self-views. So because I think I'm amazing when in fact I'm not, I'm going to appoint you just because you look like me. You know, managers tend to hire people who are like themselves is the ultimate way of getting away with kind of you know, sort of the other way of un unleashing our own narcissism. When somebody says, oh, I have a high potential employee in my team. They're amazing. And you point to them that they look just like them. They're like, oh, well, that's a coincidence there. So that happens a lot. And not hiring on your own image is very difficult. For example, hiring people who think differently from you or than you in terms of politics, ideology, religion, vision in general, it requires a very open mind, which most people don't have. I suppose that leads me then to the contentious if you then issue of hiring somebody who looks completely different from you, not just sex, but also race. Uh, what are the chances then that a, a person who was white and is a white male will more than likely promote a person who is a white male as opposed to a black male or even a black female? Yeah, I mean, you know, 
and and uh, obviously the probability is low, which doesn't mean that if you are a black female, it is okay to hire or promote a black female automatically, right? We should be looking at talent or potential. But here it's helpful to understand that, you know, our ancient brains, which evolved throughout 300,000 years or so, they're not pre-wired for diversity. For 99% of our human evolution, you know, there was no reward for going outside a little tribe and exploring life outside, you know, the 10 or 15 people who we would hang out all of our lives. In fact, if you did that because you were curious to see what your neighbor tribe looked like or because you've taken a lot of unconscious bias training and HR kind of told you to do it, right? There's a high probability that you would have been eaten, beaten, or just killed. So now society or many open and progressive well-being societies are trying to kind of erase this and override it with it, what we would call cultural evolution, which does tell us that actually, you know, we should make an effort to get along with those who not only don't look like us, but look very different and especially don't think like us. I think we are making some progress, but it's going to take time because that's not easy. And fundamentally, it might not be easy to do it in an intuitive way. You might need to actually remove humans from the equation and let, you know, data, even AI to actually identify the qualities that make people better leaders while ignoring things like race, gender, nationality, social class, and so on. Because people are not able to do it, you know, no matter, no matter how many unconscious bias training courses or hours of trainings are underpinned, I cannot look at you and forget the fact that, you know, to me, you look like a male, like a white male, like a white Irish male, and so on. In fact, if I try to ignore that, I will only think about that, which makes it impossible for me to focus on anything else. We'll come back to the evolutionary component uh, shortly, uh, and also AI, because I know you've written a book, uh, I Human, which draws on that subject too. But if we can come to a definition of what good leadership looks like, can I put this to you? The French philosopher and polymath Albert Schweitzer had a famous quote in, uh, about leadership, and he said, the three most important ways to lead people are by example, by example, by example. Now, when it comes to definitions in 2024, I presume a definition of leadership in that respect is probably, probably too simplistic and too reductive. Yeah, I think it is because, uh, well, look, if you have a diverse team and people are different, you can't expect everybody to follow your example. In fact, you have to see yourself as playing one role, right? Maybe if we look at leaders, players, captains in sports team, you can see uh, they might exemplify things like integrity, courage, and, you know, a combative spirit, but you don't have to copy everything they do. They have to actually make others better. That, I think, is a fundamental thing leaders should do. Unlock the talent and potential in others. A great leader is somebody who makes you your best possible self and who ensures that, at least in your professional capacity, you will get better and you will apply or unlock your talents. Then a good leader or a great leader is somebody who manages to temporarily suppress people's individualistic or selfish instincts so that they can become part of a bigger team, part of a group, right? Great leaders turn a group of people into a high-performing team. Even if they are a group of B players, they will create an A team. Whereas bad leaders, they might have a group of A players and they turn them into a B or C team. And finally, a great leader is somebody who drives results, somebody who makes that team better than their competitors, whether that is a you know, a for-profit, non-profit, corporation, business unit, institution, or a nation. You know, we see different. Why is Haiti different from the Dominican Republic or Singapore different from Malaysia or Argentina different from Uruguay? When in fact, you know, in some instances is the country that is doing worse or that is worse off, that has more resources, that has more possibilities. And the answer is because there were generally led by better leaders, better people who created trustworthy institutions. And with those institutions, you know, came uh, a higher probability that most people experience a better life and can actually live happier lives. To be a great leader, how important are traits like uh, kindness, empathy, self-awareness and emotional intelligence? Very important. So, you know, the research first indicates that if you look at 
personality as a whole, uh, you know, the dispositions that make you, you and different from others and the general tendency that actually uh, tendencies that underpin your habit, that explains about 30 or 40 percent of the variability in leadership effectiveness, right? So imagine 100 percent would include your expertise, your luck, your hard work, uh, you know, whether you are in a good place or in a bad place, you know, it matters whether you're driving a Ferrari or a Fiat Cinquecento, right? So what the team and the organization is up, there's a lot of factors that would we would need to account to get to 100%, but 40% is just your personality. And within that personality now, because this changes with the times, traits that actually improve your ability to manage people and manage yourself, um, you mentioned a few, self-awareness, humility, integrity, uh, coachability, um, I would say EQ or people skills in general are probably the majority of that 40% of the variance. In fact, as I've written, as AI becomes more and more useful, taking care of the IQ or knowledge-centric tasks that leaders have to perform, our ability to compete with others even if we use AI, comes from adding value in a human and humane way. And that calls for traits like EQ, empathy, self-awareness, humility, integrity to actually be harnessed. As we have been speaking about already, many leaders are confident, especially the people who promote them into those positions of leadership, misconstrue that confidence for competence and charisma, whereas charisma is very often just narcissism. Uh, and this has its origins, as you said, already in evolution. Could you talk to us about this? Yeah. So first, you know, for most of our evolutionary history, life was pretty simple. We live with the same 15 or 20 people. Everybody knew each other very well. Actually, leader selection was quite egalitarian. Often women were in charge, as often or more often than men in, you know, hunter-gatherer societies, for example, especially foraging societies. And, you know, we really didn't make mistakes because we picked the strongest person or the wisest person to command and lead the group. And by the way, if you made a mistake, you would disappear from the gene pool. It's not like you could then find another job and, you know, uh, you failed at executing your digital transformation strategy and then you work on another gig or assignment. Life was at stake. Um, and during this biggest portion of our human evolution, Actually, the main traits we wanted to observe were very observable. You could tell if somebody was a good hunter or a fast runner or a courageous person. And therefore, you know, there was a very, very close connection between what you could see and how the person was. Fast forward many, many thousands of years, and suddenly we're forced to, wa we're forced to judge or infer things like curiosity, empathy, integrity, even in strangers. Furthermore, even in people who come from a different culture, different walks of life, etc. And so we think that our intuition is still working as it did for most of our evolutionary history, but actually it's outdated, right? Most voters, they think that when they watch a presidential debate or a political debate, in 30 seconds they can say, oh, I'm going to vote for this person or that person because they look good, they're funny, or they're wearing a nice suit. Actually, there is no connection whatsoever between those things and being a good manager or a good leader. So, you know, learning to distrust our instincts is one of the fundamental requirements to upgrade the quality of our leaders. And it requires humility, of course. So is evolution the reason then why strong men and brash leaders, loud leaders like uh, leaders of politics, for example, Trump or extreme examples like Putin or business leaders like Elon Musk, these people are loud. They are very often overbearing, but they are charismatic too. Is, is evolution the reason why people find these individuals so charismatic and so popular? It's actually not evolution, because if you look at evolution, again, you have to look at 300,000 years. And again, think about the fact that for 90% or so of this time, actually, we lived in small groups, hunter-gatherers. It was very... People had to get along in order to survive, right? So they couldn't pick a narcissistic, psychopathic person to... If you did that, you would be killed automatically, right? So actually, leader selection was far more oriented on 
knowledge on people who cared about the benefit of the group, etc. There, there are many people, including Freud, who argue that if you look at the Middle Ages onwards, we spent a long time being sort of like uh, tortured and subdued and subjugated by this alpha male type of leader, right? A despotic tyrant man who, you know, there's something in the collective unconscious that actually comes from this more recent period. My explanation is different, which is that as the world becomes more complex, you know, you have two options. Either embrace ambiguity, ambivalence, which means you become, you know, very neurotic, you have to be thinking a lot, and it's a lot of kind of um, energy consumption for your brain, you know, to actually think about wondering about what's happening with the big questions of the world, what's happening with climate change, what's happening with AI, what will happen to the planet, what will happen to, you know, nuclear warfare, etc. I mean, to actually find rational answers to these questions, you have to spend a lot of time studying, learning, being open-minded, etc., which most people don't have time for. Or you can follow a person who will tell you, I know the answer, it is like that. And they say, wow, this... So confidence is a substitute for competence, which is, it has a populist appeal because it makes things simple, even when they are complex. And by the way, when that message is not just de delivered in a seemingly assertive and confident way, but also they tell us that we are smart and everybody else is stupid, that we're going to be fine and everybody else is doomed, you know, basically we gravitate in an emotional way to that. So as the world become more, becomes more complex, we need to think slower and harder, but our need for certainty and meaning and the fact that we are time deprived means that we gravitate towards people who say, I know the answer, right? So go back to the pandemic, the beginnings of the pandemic, and you look at how Merkel and Trump handled that. Trump said, don't worry, this is a flu. It will be over by April. People loved him. Merkel said, I don't know the answer. We have to work it out. And, you know, because for the majority of people, that would have been unacceptable. She should quit. Turns out, actually, you know, she has mature followers that thought, okay, if she says, I don't know, it's because the situation is complex, the problem is big, but we trust that she will find the rational solution for it, right? So my colleague Barbara Kellerman at Harvard talks about the importance of maturity in followers, which is really, really important because the more immature your followers, the more likely it is that you have a despotic, tyrannical, autocratic, overconfident man in charge who actually doesn't know what they're talking about. Oh, that's amazing to hear, actually. It's uh, what a great answer. And so I suppose really then people are drawn towards these despotic leaders who give an air of certainty and confidence out of survival. It's a survivalist strategy, really, is it? I think it's partly a survivalist strategy, but partly is because they are narcissistic themselves, you know, and they have sort of like inflated but fragile egos. They need somebody to tell. It's like they miss their parents who always told them how good and smart and attractive and good looking they are. And then, you know, reality hit them. And then they're either facing depression and, you know, their self-esteem takes a big hit and the balloon kind of pops and gets deflated. Or he co here comes somebody who can be like a savior and say, no, 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 you really, really are special. And I'm going to make you great again because trust me, I'm going to get that. And, you know, and so long as they can perpetuate this delusion and inflate their egos, it doesn't matter whether they're doing a good job or a bad job. You know, not many people, and by the way, this works across the political spectrum. It's the same on the right or on the left. It doesn't matter how leaders or politicians actually do, so long as they perpetuate this narrative, this story. And because reality becomes so complex, it's very, very difficult to find clear-cut evidence or proof to basically prove that we were wrong, which would also deflate our egos. How often, from your own observations, is it a case that people gravitate towards leadership roles and politics and a business, etc., not out of a sense of altruism, not that they want to make things better, but because of that ego, because of that narcissism? Well, you know, I would say 80% of the times, but you know the saying that um, 85% of statistics are made up and it's one of them, right? So, but I mean, it's a lot. I mean, 
more interestingly and perhaps provocatively, I would say that where leaders are inept, incompetent, or fail, and that's the vast majority of them, where leaders do a good job, that's because actually their goal is altruistic or is other-oriented. By the way, there is an argument for the fact that if you want to improve the conditions of others or save a company or rescue an organization or actually improve the state of a nation, that's altruistic, even though you might also be pursuing, you know, fame and accolades and recognition. So there might always be uh, a self-serving or self-enhancing motive. But if that's mediated by the well-being of others, it means that you would actually have integrity, you will care about others, and you will think twice before you do something that can harm others. Whereas on the other example, if, if you're just in it for your own success, fame, money, etc., you become very dangerous. And if on top of that, you are charismatic and you have a widespread appeal, I mean, we've seen it, right? Whether it's Mao, Hitler, Stalin, charisma is neither good nor bad. But if it's coupled with low ethics and integrity, it's really, really destructive. And if it's coupled with low, low competence, it's also very, very destructive. We spoke earlier about the traits of a good leader being empathy, humility and kindness. Um, I was just wondering, are people who possess those traits less likely to be drawn to leadership roles in the first place? It, to some degree, yes, and not necessarily because they don't want to, but because of two reasons. One, you know, they have been influenced by this um, inaccurate misconception that to be a good leader, you have to look like, you know, the Wolf of Wall Street or Vladimir Putin or, you know, like a very strong and uh, brutal, selfish, narcissistic male. And secondly, even if they have the right notion and they're aware of the fact that these are the traits that make people better leaders, they might have realized that they're not the traits that usually make people leaders. So therefore, there is that disconnect. And I think, you know, you can't blame them for trying only for some time and then giving up. Even if you think of things like, you know, the lean-in kind of idea that, you know, which women need to be more assertive and self-promote more and lean in so that they won't be overlooked for leadership roles. In a in a logical world, we wouldn't accuse or blame people for not self-promoting or not advertising themselves or not playing politics. In fact, you know, you would actually tap those in the back who are quietly doing their work and making others better. There is this wonderful quote by Plato that says, only those who don't seek power should be allowed to have it. It's the anti-lean in, if you think. And that doesn't happen very often. Of course, you know, many people are aware of it and logically or theoretically agree, but it's not so widely implemented. We've mentioned men um, repeatedly in this conversation, men, masculinity and uh, traits of dominance. But in the book, uh, you say that female leaders actually have an advantage when it comes to leadership. Can you talk to me about this? Yeah, so if we made leadership selection gender blind, and it's like, you know, in a wine tasting, you don't see what you're tasting and you can't see how much the bottle costs, right? So we're blind to gender. And we actually put in place meritocratic systems that select leaders on the basis of their hard skills. Well, more women go to university than men, more women outperform men at university than the other way around. Even in MBAs, which is still the number one title or um, you know college credential that makes you a leader. Not that it should be, but it still is. So on the basis of hard skills, there should be more women than men in leadership roles. On the basis of soft skills, we talked about it. If you selected leaders on the basis of their self-awareness, humility, integrity, EQ, coachability, uh, um, self-control, on average women outperform men in science-based measures or assessments of these traits. So again, you know, about 60% of leaders will be female rather than male. And if you actually ensure that you screen out candidates for leadership roles because, you know, you don't want to select on dark side traits like narcissism, psychopathy, antisocial traits like Machiavellianism, these traits are much more commonly found in men than women. 
So again, you know, I always say the best gender diversity inter uh, best gender diversity inter in intervention is to focus on talent rather than gender. And then you would not, not only get more women in leadership roles, you get more women than men in leadership roles and simultaneously elevate the quality of leaders. By the way, this would also ensure that more men who have the hard skills and the soft skills that we need in effective leaders would get uh, put in leadership roles. Many, many competent men are disadvantaged today because of their more effeminate or feminine profile. You said earlier in the conversation that, again, another trait of a good leader is their ability to go against their instincts. I presume it comes easier than uh, to women to go against their instincts than men. Not necessarily. So this one would be captured by a trait called openness to experience or open-mindedness. And actually, it's one where you don't have uh, significant gender differences. What's interesting here is that, you know, if you look at the research, something like 90% of people see themselves as open-minded in general, whether a man or women. It's like 90% of people think they have a great sense of humor or that they're very creative. How many people actually are? I would even argue that the 10% that tell you they are not open-minded are probably quite open-minded because at least they are self-critical. Um, so, you know, I think where women have an advantage is when it comes to coachability and self-awareness, which can actually help you overcome some of your biases. I mean, the fact that, you know, we have been almost on a witch, witch hunt against women telling them that they should overcome their imposter syndrome, that they have an inferiority complex, etc. when actually women are not insecure, they're just more open to negative critical feedback that can help them get better, whereas men are more immune to it. Actually, that's a classic example of how we are persecuting or accusing or blaming women for something that is an advantage while celebrating men for something that is a disadvantage. I always say it will be the equivalent of like understanding that... Uh, Height is advantageous if you want to be a good basketball player. So we're deliberately selecting small, short players and, you know, letting tall players out. You've said elsewhere that social media has made us narcissists, but uh, you believe there is a cure to this. First of all, how do I know if I'm a narcissist and how do I fix that? We well, can share a little assessment if you want afterwards, which you can also share with your audience. But, you know, fundamentally... First, the research shows that uh, you can't blame social media for actually making society or us, including especially young people, more narcissistic or narcissistic because this has been a trend that has been well documented over the past century. Over time, we become more entitled, more self-centered, more egotistical, less empathetic and so on, which is a problem. But then if you add social media to it, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, etc., it's like throwing gasoline to the fire. And studies have shown that the more you use social media and the more dependent you are on other people's feedbacks, et cetera, the more narcissistic you are. And, you know, as you do this, this makes you even more narcissistic. So there is basically like a feedback uh, loop or this snowballs. And I think the best uh, way to check if you have narcissistic kind of... Uh, um, you know, tendencies or dispositions is A, do you think highly of yourself? How do you know this? Uh, have a little check with others, with your colleagues, your friend, your bosses, your partner, etc., and see whether your self-estimates of ability match how they see you. Secondly, are you very dependent on other people's appreciation, recognition, feedback? You know, the most common form of narcissism is called vulnerable narcissism. It's kind of neurotic narcissism. Think of David Brent, Ricky Gervais in The Office, right? He kind of thinks he's great, but he's not totally convinced, which makes it very tedious because he's content, constantly looking for praises. And then, of course, we empathize with them because we feel sorry for them, of course, because he's not our real boss. He's a fictional character. And then thirdly, I would say really see how empathetic you are, how often you can not just recognize and identify other people's emotions, but actually act in prosocial and benevolent ways. Uh, narcissistic individuals are seen as selfish, egotistical, and, you know, not altruistic by others. 
You wrote an entire book on confidence, uh, which I link in the show notes for this episode. How important, how key, how crucial is confidence for us to to get on in life professionally and uh, personally? It's very important, um, but I guess there are two sides to it. One is that in a logical world, the only level of confidence that would matter is one that is actually in sync with our actual abilities, right? So whether it's like, I'm about to cross a busy road. It helps to know whether I can get to the other side before the bus comes. If I think I can, but I don't, you know, the bus will hit me. Now, in the real world, actually, a lot of the instances that define our success aren't as clear-cut as a bus coming there. They involve impressing others and persuading others who aren't very competent that we actually have talents. And there, you know, we talked a little bit about evolution, but there is a very good explanation for the pervasive nature of overconfidence in society, not just in Argentina, where I come from, but I'm sure, you know, uh, everywhere else, including Ireland and including, by the way, in traditionally humble collectivistic societies like Japan, South Korea, etc., we're trending towards overconfidence. And that is that if you fool yourself into thinking that you're amazing, even if you're not, it's going to be a lot easier for you to fool other people the same. So, you know, just like the best best salespeople lie to themselves and they, they don't have to lie to others, self-deception is the best strategy for deceiving others. So think about you go to a job interview and they ask you, how good are you working with other people? And you think that you're actually amazing, even though every single colleague and coworker you had hated being with you and hated working with you. You're going to say, oh, I'm amazing, I'm the life and soul of a room, I'm so funny, I help others, whatever. And if people see that you're convinced, they're going to say, wow, this must be a great team, you know, worker or colleague. So, you know, we need for others to get better at spotting competence so that we basically uh, mitigate the effects that overconfident can have, which by the way, if it helps you, but then when I hire you, it turns out you were a jerk and you were really, really toxic and no, then I make a mistake, right? We have to select for what's good for the organization, the group, the collective, not what's good for the individual. AI is something that is creeping more and more into our lives every single day. I have to ask you about this again. You write about it in another of your books, I Human. What challenges do you think the advent of AI presents the human race? Because you allude to digital narcissism and weapons of mass distraction, which can only retard our collective progress, surely. The book, you know, I talk a lot about what AI has done to us so far. And, you know, I think it is clear to me that most people interact with AI, not through ChatGPT or generative AI, but through these algorithmic nudges, recommendation engines uh, that try to hijack our attention and, you know, co-opt our focus, etc. If you look at what AI has done in this first phase, these last 10 years, which are the equivalent to the dial-up phase of the internet, right? It's just the beginning, which might be a scary thought. It's very clear that it has made us more narcissistic by, you know, making us basically normalizing digital narcissism and making us more focused on ourselves and eager to self-promote, etc. In the real world, if you go around the office telling everybody how amazing you are and you got upgraded to business class and, of course, sharing with everybody what your cat had for breakfast, you'll be deemed pretty obnoxious. But on social media, you will be an influencer thanks to the algorithms that, you know, reward you for that. Equally, we're becoming more politically tribalized and polarized and biased because AI makes it very hard to exit our filter bubbles, our digital cocoons, and hear of people from people who are different from us. And we're becoming more attention deprived and more bored, more impulsive, not to mention more boring and less creative because now we're even outsourcing creative stuff to generative AI. But I think that also speaks to our biggest opportunity, which is to act on it and do something about it. I think it's still in us to actually rethink how we can add value and rediscover the qualities that make us human and humane, the things that AI would probably not reproduce, you know, things like deep curiosity, the desire to learn and understand things, not, you know, just put words together. And uh, I mean, AI, generative AI is basically like a microwave for ideas. So that's it. So just like fast food took off and became very big, 
it also led to the slow food movement and the farm to table movement. I think we need the equivalent on the intellectual level. And I think fundamentally we need to learn to become a little bit more empathetic, more tolerant, and rediscover the pleasures of the analog world, which you know we seem to have forgotten about because we spent more time looking at ourselves in a screen than other humans in real life. We're doing this at the moment, you and I. So here's here, that's how's that for hypocrisy? <laughs> So many great observations. Uh, the book on leadership, again, is called Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders? Dr. Thomas, thank you so much. Great to talk to you today. Great pleasure. And uh, anytime. It's been a great conversation. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for tuning into this episode of the Happy Habit Podcast. If you liked it or any of the previous almost 400 episodes, show your support. It'll cost you nothing. Like, subscribe, share, leave a comment if you're on YouTube. And leave the podcast a positive rating. Three, four, five stars, whatever you think we deserve. Until next time, stay happy.